All right, um, good morning and welcome to the third and last day of the workshop. Um, today we're gonna kick off with uh, the keynote by Dr. John Bell. And uh, it's uh, with, with incredible pleasure that we have uh, Dr. Bell here with us to deliver a talk. Uh, Dr. Bell is a senior staff mathematician at the Lawrence uh, Berkeley National Laboratory, where he's also the um, chief director of the Computational Research Division. Um, John Bell has made uh, an incredible number of contributions in the development and analysis of a variety of numerical methods for uh, partial differential equations, and has then gone, gone on to apply those methods to, again, a variety of, of problems in all realms of uh, science and engineering, including seismology, of course, um, turbulent combustion, as well as uh, astrophysics. Um, so without further ado, I think we'll be delighted uh, by uh, Dr. Bell's talk. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. I've had a lovely time so far. Um, Hopefully the snorkeling in the Red Sea will be just as good as the, the meeting. Uh, okay. Um, as first of all, let me just acknowledge that there are several people's work that is going to be included in what I'm going to talk about today, and I will begin with the same apology that almost every that several other people have had, which is um, I don't do anything at high pressure really, and I'm actually, well, we can debate whether I've done anything that's highly turbulent uh, at high Reynolds number or not. But anyway, let's see what happens anyway. So just by way of a brief outline, um, what I want to do is just talk about basic equations and models where, by models, I don't mean turbulence models, but other kinds of models. Um, in particular, I'm going to talk about how you do transport and reactions. I'm going to then show how you get to a low Mach number model. I'll talk a little bit about the numerical methodology, what's the basic discretization strategy, how do you deal with this system, and then I'll talk about adaptive mesh refinement very briefly, and then I'll show some numerical examples. Um, also, I was a little uncertain what to talk about, so I've dealt with that by making the talk way too long, so we'll triage on the fly and see what happens. Okay, um, again, this is we are just going to focus on gas phase combustion, no liquid sprays or anything, so it's the usual fluid mechanics stuff. Um, you guys know all of this. Thermodynamics, chemistry, species, transport are going to be inputs to the model as some kind of radiation. Um, I'll kind of dispense with radiation for the most part. We, in everything we do, we view the medium as optically thin and um, radiation is just an uh, energy loss term. Uh, and this is just a, a, a pretty picture, but the, the guy to say, what we want to do is we want to be able to simulate with enough detail that we can understand the internal flame structure and how that flame structure responds to different things in the turbulent field. So, and this is just an example showing um, simulated OH profiles for propane, methane, and hydrogen, showing how they respond differently to curvature. Uh, so methane is, is insensitive to curvature at, at these conditions. Um, Hydrogen burning is enhanced in regions of positive curvature and propane is reduced. Everybody, that's... So, so the system that we're dealing with is um, compressible Navier-Stokes, which I've written down here. Um, conservation of, of species, energy, and momentum. Um, and again, this is closed by thermodynamic relationships, reaction kinetics models, and transport models at various levels of fidelity, ranging from fixed Lewis numbers to a mixture model. We, that's, we typically live in the middle for most of our calculations. And then there's, there's full matrix formulations that has everything in it. Um, since this is a high pressure flame workshop, I was just sort of speculating from work I've done in other areas. Uh, about what might we want to worry about here. That, that, so I think everybody's well aware of the fact, and we've heard it a couple of times, that whenever you go to very high pressures, you can be above the critical point and get supercritical flames and, and all of that. But I was wondering if there are other things you need to consider. So for example, are we missing key reactions? when you go to high pressure, are there reactions there that, that, that we don't account for in the models? You can't take a model off the shelf and use it. Um, 
again, is the model of radiation good enough or do we need to do something more sophisticated as we go to higher pressures? Um, do we need to consider non-ideal effects in thermodynamics, transport, and reactions? Um, most combustion simulations, maybe that's not right, most combustion simulations use an ideal gas equation of state. That's particularly true in the low Mach number world. If you want to change that in a compressible code, it's not a big deal. In the low Mach number world, it's a little bit trickier. Um, and there are potential non-ideal transport effects and more the, a generalized law of mass action. So, uh, and, and just to remind you of how these things work, um, these things are all basically derived from the chemical potential. Oh, I could use this thing, couldn't I? Um, okay. Um, if you if you look in the literature. Um, for a non-ideal fluid, the chemical potential is, is KBT over MK. That's Boltzmann constant temperature over the mass of the species. I've been hanging around with physicists too long in notation. Um, so there's a, a, a reference piece, and then there is um, the log of the mole fraction plus the log of this thing called gamma K, which is the um, activity coefficient. And so in, in this, the usual thing that most of us work with is where gamma K is equal to one is an ideal gas. And these gammas can depend on concentration and pressure and temperature. Um, and this additional term in the, in the, in the uh, chemical potential affects both species transport and reaction. I'll just briefly go over it. Before I talk about that, um, the, whenever you do chemistry, it's better to work with a non-dimensionalized chemical potential per, per Per, atom, per molecule, which is just scaling this through by that one over that thing. Okay. Um, the structure of all of this comes from just standard non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Uh, you can read the ancient texts from back in the 1960s. Um, basically, entropy production is the inner product of a heat transfer, uh, a heat flux times a temperature gradient. Uh, plus species transport times this gradient of the chemical potential with temperature held fixed. Uh, this reduced temp and that's the reduced heat flux is this thing. And generic basic uh, phenomenal logical laws from non-equilibrium thermodynamics says that these, the fluxes are given by a matrix times uh, the thermodynamic forces where the thermodynamic forces are the gradient of the chemical potential and the gradient of temperature and those are the those are the species fluxes. And this L is called the Ansager matrix. What that means is that the species flux are given by this gradient, this, this gradient at constant temperature of the chemical potential. If I carry through a bunch of linear algebra, what I get is this odd expression here. I get some scaling. That's a matrix of the, a diagonal matrix of mass fractions with inverse. Then you have this matrix gamma. Gamma represents the non-ideal parts of this. Gamma is equal to the identity matrix for an ideal gas, and you have this, this gamma in the thing. Um, you never work with this numerically. It's kind of ill-behaved, so when you do numerics, you write things in terms of what they call the diffusion driving force, which in this case is, there's that matrix gamma, and then the phi's here are, the, they're called the partial volumes in Ideal gas world, that's the mole fraction. It's, it's something, it's the gradient of a potential with respect to pressure in, in, um, in this more general setting. And then there's a scaling. So and then this, this reduces to the usual thing that you all know about whenever you um, collapse it back to, to ideal gases. So this is, this is then the general form of what the species fluxes are, where you get this matrix of diffusion coefficients by doing some linear algebra based on Stefan, Stefan Maxwell relations, um, which relate the, this, this, thermo, this diffusion driving force to the relative species velocities in, in, in sort of a drag law type context. Okay, so this is one of these, almost an aside, there are non-ideal effects. Do they matter? I don't know. I, I'm hoping somebody can maybe tell me offline. Um, same thing enters in reactions. Um, I want to go through this because this, this will rear its ugly head 
in a little bit in a different way. Uh, I have a bunch of chemical reactions. They're all elementary, so stoichia, this is a funny way of writing, maybe this, well. You have forward and reverse rates, molecules transferring back and forth, stoichiometrics are the, are the, the news. Um, so you define something called the chemical affinity, which is the difference in the chemical potentials times the stoichiometric coefficients of the forward guys minus the reverse guys. Um, and and the, the, the re reactions come out of that. In fact, what the reactions look like are, um, you sum over, to get the, the source term, you sum over the reaction, but you have a pressure over KBT, then you have this time, time scale that characterizes the reaction. Then here is the, uh, a modified version of that chemical affinity, which you get by taking the exponential of the part on the left minus the exponential of the part on the right. There's an important thing here. The important thing here, well, there's several important things here. One is that if you want to be thermodynamically consistent, all rates are reversible. Um, most important thing is, in fact, there's only a single rate. So we typically write these things as a forward and a reverse rate, but there's actually only one independent rate. The other one's determined by chemical equi by thermodynamic equilibrium. And what that rate describes is how quickly the reaction moves toward chemical equilibrium. That, that, that will end up saving our day in a little bit, and I'll show you where. Okay, um, I'll get away from this, this sort of tirade about non-ideal in a second. Um, if I now substitute in my, my onsets for what the chemical potential looks like, I get something that looks like the standard law of mass action, but those activity coefficients appear in there, and they modify the system. Um, so again, I've got forward and reverse rates appearing, but those forward and reverse rates are linked by a constant called a K sub I, which is a function of pressure and temperature, and that is a statement that, that that's the characterization of what thermodynamic equilibrium is. So again, there is one rate plus there is a characterization of thermodynamic equilibrium, and that can be computed from pure component data. Okay. Returning to the real world of ideal gases. Um, so what I want to do now is to sort of, it, we've actually been motivated for some time by seeing if we could actually simulate a real laboratory experiment. So to do that, it's useful to sort of look at the scales that you're going to have to deal with. And this is a me scattering image from um, Robert Chang. It's a low swirl burner. Um, The diameter there, I think, is about five is about five centimeters. Anyway, so if you want to simulate something like this, what are you looking at? Well, spatially, you've got a domain. You've got to simulate something that's on the order of tens of centimeters in size. Um, you have a flame thickness that is order of a millimeter or or less, depending on when you, as you go leaner, the, it, it, it gets larger. But but that's kind of a nominal working thing. You have turbulent integral scales that look like they're on the two to six millimeter range. Um, so so there, there's your range of spatial scales. Um, well, you have a flame speed. Flames are going to you know, um, move at tens of centimeters per second, perhaps. Um, they live in a mean flow thing, and these things, that's in the tens of meters per second, typically. Um, but there's an acoustic speed that's about a kilometer per second. Um, and then there are potentially really fast chemical time scales in these things, and, and again, you can get away with having fast chemical, chemical time scales because the fast behavior is the relaxation toward chemical equilibrium, which you stay close to. Okay. So the idea is, can we exploit this separation of scales to be able to compute more efficiently? Um, so again, this is, this, is, this is kind of our target. The main deal is we want, to, we want to do DNSs, so there's not going to be any turbulence model or a turbulence chemi chemistry interaction model. We want to have detailed chemistry and transport so that we can distinguish uh, fuel effects in this. And we need to be able to compute over a sufficiently wide range of scales that we can at least represent realistic flames with realistic turbulence, where you may decide to put that in quotes later. Um, okay. And whatever you do is going to have to exploit 
high performance architectures. Um, so here's the standard straw man. Um, at least most of the DNSs to date have been done with direct integration of compressible and obvious Stokes equations. So what you do is you discretize in space, usually with something really high order, and the spatial discretization is set by the resolution you need to capture the smallest feature in the flow. And then you identify the time step you need based on resolving the fastest time scale in the flow, which is typically chemistry. Uh, then you, you've now converted this thing into a set of ODEs with a time step. You use an explicit ODE integrator. People usually use fourth order Runge Kutta variants for that. And this is done very well because as machine power has, gone has grown, the ability to do these kinds of calculations has grown light, right along with it because these things scale perfectly. These can, uh, they can change, it deal with any machine that comes on the floor, basically. Um, but because of the things, the, the, the range of length and time scales in the problem kind of limits what you do. So what I want to do is talk about are there ways that I can exploit the mathematical structure of the problem to be able to compute more efficiently? And what we're going to do is, whoa, what we're going to do is go to a low Mach number formulation. That will help me with the temporal scales. In particular, it will get rid of the acoustic scales. And we're going to look at adaptive mesh refinement, which will at least, at least give us some control over resolution of spatial scales. OK. So. How does this low Mach number stuff work? Um, uh, historically, it was invented by Riem and Baum, who were physicists at the then National Bureau of Standards. And then a few years later, seven years later, the mathematicians came in and had their way with it. Um, the idea is you start with the compressible Navier-Stokes equations. You suitably non-dimensionalize it. And then you basically say that I'm going to look at asymptotics in Mach number which is the velocity over the speed of sound. And I will take the limit then of that system as the Mach number goes to zero. And here's what pops out. What pops out is the pressure can be decomposed into a, a piece of zero, which is only a function of time. It has no, can have no spatial gradients, plus a pi, where this pi is an order Mach number squared perturbation to the thermodynamic pressure. And so, so, far, so far, that's just analysis. When you go to the low Mach number limit, what you then do is you say that this P0 carries all the thermodynamic information. P0 doesn't, this, this, this pi has no thermodynamic content. All, the, all of the thermodynamics is carried by P0, and P0 doesn't affect the local dynamics. Um, what this has the effect of doing is building in an assumption that all acoustic waves are instantaneously equilibrated across the domain. Um, and it has the property that if you're looking at an open container, this P0 is just constant. So if, you're, if your flame or whatever is connected to a, uh, some, pressure, some, some fixed pressure reservoir, it will stay at that pressure. OK, what do the equations look like? Um, and I warn you, I think of this a little differently than sort of well, everybody else. Um, you could retain the species equations just as before, and they add up to being the, the, the conservation of mass equation. Um, the energy equation is most naturally expressed in terms of an enthalpy. So that's the enthalpy equation. Um, what you've basically done here is, is all kinetic energy type terms have dropped out of this. And then here's the momentum equation, which looks like the momentum equation before, except now it's got this pi in it instead of a pressure. And that's that perturbational thing. Um, and then what I want this to do is I want this to evolve subject to the equation of state being satisfied. So the way I'm thinking of this is here I'm evolving a complete set of thermodynamic equations. I've got, I'm evolving density, species mass fractions, and enthalpy. Out of those, I can compute what the temperature is. And so I can evaluate from the evolution of the energy and the species equations a pressure. And what I want to do is constrain the evolution of this system 
so that that pressure is the P0, which is the background ambient pressure, and the control that does that is pi. So what this does is it takes my nice initial value problem for the compressible Navier-Stokes equations and converts it into a high index differential algebraic equation. And if you were a mathematician, you know when I said that I've made, I've suddenly made the problem a lot harder. So what I've done is I've taken a very nice, more or less benign system of equations and I have uh, converted that into this more complicated object, but this more complicated object evol evolves in the time scale of fluid motion, not acoustic waves. So I would, I will expect to be able to time step this at the, at the fluid velocity, not the sound speed. So rather, perhaps rather obviously, whether this is worth anything or not depends on whether or not I can actually find a way to integrate this system in a reasonable way. Okay. So when you're faced with a differential algebraic equation, what you always do is you differentiate the constraint. So I'll differentiate the constraint along <laughs> particle paths. If you do that, you get um, the P0 dt plus some factor times the divergence of u is equal to the P dt times the derivative of, uh, of temperature plus the P dyk times the derivative of yk. Okay, in that system, I didn't have a, an equation. I didn't have an equation for um, temperature, but I can get one because, and the way you do this, this is, um, and for the aficionados, a subtlety. You write the enthalpy as a function of pressure, temperature, and mass fractions. Differentiate that, and you can unravel that into a temperature equation. And if you do that, then, this is the correct generalization of standard low Mach number models to, um, non, to a general equation state. Okay, um, if you do some algebra and you're really good at thermodynamic identities, you can show that this is um, one over gamma one to P zero, where that's the first adiabatic exponent times TB zero, the P zero dt plus del dot u is equal to some h where h is some complicated spatial operator applied to thermodynamic variables. And what it expresses is the degree to which the fluid expands as a result of all these other processes. Um, again, in a open chamber, P0 is constant, so this gives you a divergence condition on H specification. When the system's closed, the average of H defines the evolution of P0. Um, okay, now, the hint here is that um, I've got a system in which I've now written this as the divergence of u is equal to zero, and if you've done computational fluids before, you say, ah, I know systems like that. How about the incompressible Navier-Stokes? So there's the incompressible Navier-Stokes. It evolves subject to the divergence of the velocity field is zero, um, and at least for moderate to high Reynolds numbers flows, there's uh, there are a tech set of techniques called projection methods that are very effective for that. And what they do is you advance the system with some sort of lagged approximation to this, to this perturbational pressure. That lets you drift off the constraint, but you can push yourself back onto a constraint by having this operator P that, that makes you be, that takes a velocity field and gets you the divergence free part of it. Okay. Can this be used for the Lomach number combustion model? Well, the answer is yes. It can, but you have to deal with finite, finite amplitude density variation and the inhomogeneous constraint. Fortunately, there are, I won't go into all the details of this, fortunately, there are vast families of vector field decomposition that you can use, and here's one that works well. You have a velocity, any velocity field can be decomposed into a divergence-free piece, the gradient of some scalar plus one over rho times the gradient of another scalar. And in this low Mach number setting, the velocity field you want to look at is this, the, the, the divergence-free part plus this gradient of a scalar, and for variable density flows, one over rho times the gradient of another scalar is the right orthogonality, and this, this C guy carries, that carries the compressibility effects in the medium. And you can define um, nice abstract operators that solve that, but basically, what you do is you solve a 
you have to solve numerically a variable coefficient elliptic PDE to sort of enforce the constraint. So that's going to be part of, of this. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so what this gives you is a, is a fractional time step scheme, which is to um, advance the velocity and all the thermodynamic variables, just forgetting about the fact that there's a constrained evolution, and then project yourself back onto the constraint, which is done with a variable coefficient elliptic solve. Um, now the last problem that you have to deal with, and someone alluded to this before, is now I've got this system of thermodynamic quantities that I need to advance. How do I want to do that? Well, the problem is that these connect kinetics equations are potentially really stiff, so how am I going to deal with, do with that? And what, what we've done for a long time is um, we use this symmetric splitting where you do the chemistry for half of a time step, then you do your advection diffusion step, and then you do some more chemistry. Um, and that, that actually ends up make the, making the whole thing second order accurate. And it's nice, it decomposes this into a combination of processes, and I can treat each one of them in the way they would like to be treated, but it's inherently limited to being second order, and in fact, there's splitting error associated with this that maybe you want to deal with. So we've been looking at how do you get around that, and so how can I introduce more coupling? Uh, well, there's a whole bunch of stress splitting strategies. The reality is none of them is really very good, so we'll just ignore those. You could decide that, well, I really need to couple these processes. That's really important, so let me go to a method of lines approach and do, do uh, a big fully coupled nonlinear system, but for the problems we want to do, that, that blows you out of the water. Um, so we've been playing with um, an idea called spectral deferred corrections. What that is, is instead of doing, writing things as ODEs and integrating in time, some, what I'll do is I'll write this as an integral and then try to evaluate the integral in some appropriate way. Um, and if I do that, I can do each of my processes separately, but iteratively couple them together so that I end up getting a, a, fully, a fully coupled evolution, but using pieces where I operate individual operators separately. And it does something rather remarkable. And I hope you can, it's a little, I tried to make this bolder last night and couldn't see it. So here's, if you think about it, here's what this string thing does. So, you start at the beginning of a time step and you integrate along and it's going to go to some, it's, it's gonna, it, it, we talked about what chemistry does, it's moving to sort of some, some chemical equilibrium, but it's a chemical equilibrium that has no advection and diffusion in it, so it's not really quite right. So then you do your advection diffusion step and that moves you from here up to here and then, okay, now I'm going to do chemistry again. What have I done? What I've done is I have now moved myself to a place that's really quite far from chemical equilibrium. And so, because the chemistry's stiff, it wants to go back there, and in this case, it goes back there by doing this very rapid transition through all these weird states. And what bottom line of that is that actually ends up being um, kind of nasty to integrate. If you do this SDC stuff, what you're doing is the chemistry is being fed your current best approximation to what the advection and diffusion look like, and so now here's what your chemistry evolution is doing, which is much more like what you would want. So you've, you've by coupling the processes, we have to do a little bit more operate, more, how do you say, you make more calls to the chemistry solver, but they're actually much easier, so this actually ends up being a significant win. Okay. Um, Um, there's a subtlety to this in that numerically we differentiated the constraint and used that to do the evolution so you're not quite on the constraint manifold. You, so the theories for differential algebraic equations work really well up to index two. This is uh, worse than that. So there's sort of a, um, an outer iter, oops an outer iteration that pulls you back onto the actual constraint manifold that we do. Now, <coughs> so a reasonable question to ask is how much have I made an error by going to this low Mach number? Surely I will see differences if I do this compressively. 
And so what we did is um, we ran, this is, this is on, there's a bunch of frames here. In each pair, the left guy is my version of a high order DNS code. Um, and so this is a, this is a dimethyl ether jet with a, with a hot coflow. The, the domain's a lot bigger than this. I just zoomed in on the, on the jet itself. Uh, the jet width is 114 microns, and it's coming in at 51 meters per second. So it, 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 it's kind of clipping along. Um, and again, this is at, at 40 atmospheres. And this is, this density and temperature, those are pretty good. And um, that's OH and ethane, ethene. I don't know how to say that. Uh, so if you look at that very you see, okay, this is actually working really well. I'm not getting any detectable difference by having this low Mach number thing. So, so it actually all works. Um, adaptive mesh refinement. Um, there are many ways to do adaptive mesh refinement. I will briefly talk about ours, and I promise I'll talk about combustion stuff. Um, we use a block structured approach. This is a an old vortex flame interaction, and you can see a bunch of squares, or maybe you can see a bunch of squares that tile the flame front. Um, those are large aggregate objects. They're not single grid cells. They're, they're mini patches aggregated together. Um, so this covers, the this covers the domain in relatively large grid patches. They're logically structured rectangular. Um, we allow refinement in space and time by evenly dividing coarse cells by some factor. And these things are dynamically created and destroyed. Um, this actually turns out to be a very nice, there's a nice model for hybrid parallelization here because you can use MPI to do the coarse grain data distribution of these patches. And then you can use OpenMP to do fine grain threading work on um, the individual grids. Okay. Um, just a, a, a comment. Um, one of the things that happens here, someone alluded to this earlier, is that whenever you do these low Mach number things, now I'm calling stiff ODE integrators, which means that the workload is heterogeneous. The, the, the work in the cold part of the flame to do the ODE integration is really different than what I get if I'm in the middle of the flame. So what we do is we monitor how hard the chemistry problem is and use that to do a load balance. So you do a load balancing based on work, not number of points, and that, that makes this all scale reasonably well. Um, and again, we, s we have the support to allow subcycling in time so that if I refine in space, I can also refine in time. Um, the way this kind of works is you advance the coarsest level, you advance the fine level, then you advance finer levels. Whenever two levels get to the same point, you synchronize them and off you go recursively. Um, promise this is the last math slide. Um, so um, this, actually, this slide actually tells you everything you need to know about adaptive mesh refinement. Um, the way you do this is you have coarse grids. The coarse grids supply Dirichlet boundary conditions for fine grids. If you look at what happens whenever the coarse and the fine gets to the same point, you find that there's a, a, a mismatch in the flux at the coarse fine interfaces. So, what you do is you correct that, and you can derive a correction equation. The correction equation depends on the properties of the operator. So if it's a hyperbolic operation, the synchronization operator will look like a simple hyperbolic thing. If it's an elliptic equation, it will look like a single layer potential problem. So, but if you do that and keep track of it all, you can make these things, and you can basically make an algorithm that preserves all the properties of the single grid algorithm. And, uh, in, the, in a Hippocratic oath form, does no harm. Okay, an example. Um, <coughs> this is a, uh, the low swirl burner. It was developed by Robert Chang and collaborators. Um, I suspect most of you have seen this before, but if you haven't, um, in a typical swirl burner, there's a bluff body that sticks out here. In this, what Robert did instead is he put in a, a screen so that you have an outer swirling flow that, that surrounds a, an inner turbulent core. And what that does is it, um, when things exit the nozzle, nozzle, the flow expands and it slows down, and you get an aerodynamically stabilized flame that sits there. Um, 
this is hydrogen, so it doesn't look terribly stable. Um, so this was actually originally invented by Robert, I don't know if he'd want to admit this or not, so that he could look at do fundamental flame interaction investigations, but people have investigated, I think it's actually been used in furnaces and boilers and has been at least explored, probably used, for gas turbine injectors. Um, and it has some nice features. It's relatively fuel flexible. Um, it's relatively scalable by which you can, by which I mean you can change the flow rates and it all kind of just keeps working. So we're going to look um, at a case here of, of a lean hydrogen flame when they tried to burn this because we were kind of motivated by the following data that they collected. This is actually at four atmospheres. This was uh, data collected at Nettle by Robert and Pete Strakey. And what they did is they, they were, look, I, I hate the units here, but they, they the, the, the lower, the lower, the, the, the lower axis is the post flame temperature, which is, which they get by adjusting the equivalence ratio. Um, but that's the way they plotted this stuff. And the key thing that was, they, they asked us was, um, well, we, we, we said as we, to go, as we go leaner and leaner, we'd expect the amount of, of, of NOx emission to go down, but we get to a certain point and it kind of tails off what's going on. Um, so we're going to try to look at that. Um, we cheated in the sense that this was done quite a while ago. So we cheated. We did not actually try to simulate the development of the flow in, in, inside that nozzle. People have done that since and gotten very nice results by doing that. What we did is we just took measurements of the flow data right, out, right at the exit of the nozzle and used that, um, imposed some turbulence. The uh, turbulent intensity is 0.9 meters per second with an interval scale of three millimeters. So we did that and uh, this is my obligatory movie. If I can get it to play. Okay. Uh, so this, is, this, this gray junk down here is what the turbulence looks like to coming out of the swirler. Um, it's OH on the inside, and they use some flame marker. It's maybe some low threshold value of, of, of hydrogen to mark the outer edge of the envelope. And for some reason, they chose a hideous purple to do that. This is, this is a, this movie's a personal nightmare. That, Picture appears everywhere. Um, anyway, so so um, do some comparisons. So this is uh, this is the simulation we extracted out, and then uh, this is Pliff from Robert. There's a big window, which is this one, a little window, which is that. These are the comparable pieces out of the simulation. Um, um, Difficult to make a definitive answer, but but we seem to get both the large and the small scale structure of the flame more or less right. Um, and these enhanced OH signals, we do a better job of getting. We don't have as much noise. Um, they're a signature of the thermodiffusive instability, which is better seen here. Um, so as you know, lean hydrogen, and this is phi equal 0.37. Um, is thermodiffusively unstable. If I try to propagate just a flame, it will break into this corrugated thing, which is, has these bowl-like lobes. This is uh, colored by fuel consumption rate. So there's, there's basically these cells that are surrounded by regions that are effectively not burning. Um, when you add turbulence, it kind of looks like this. These are on the same scale. So what you see is, first of all, much more intense burning and if you go through and look at the curvature of the flame surface, what you also see is a transition um, in the character of the wrinkling. This is very uh, spherical looking, whereas these things are more cylindrical ribs. And you can get that by looking at statistics of, of mean and Gaussian curvature. Um, somebody said this. I will echo this. It is one thing to be able to do these simulations. It's quite another to be able to extract meaningful information about a combustion simulation from this, you would think, oh, gosh, I've got everything there is. Can't I just figure out what's going on? Um, no, you can't. Um, 
Anyway, so um, this is one of our attempts to do this sort of stuff. We uh, identify the flame surface by some temperature. We construct a local coordinate system on the flame temperature. We follow, that looks like straight lines, but it's actually um, following integral curves of the gradient of the temperature to find little flame elements in a sort of a locally 3D picture around the flame. Um, and if you integrate over one of those things and normalize it, you can get a flame consumption speed. Um, so this is, um, this is just a joint PDF of mean curvature versus the consumption speed divided by the laminar flame speed. Um, this actually basically serves to show that the laminar flame speed is meaningless for lean hydrogen. But you see the positive curvature. One of the things that, that obviously an experimentalist can't measure a fuel consumption speed, but we did a, we were able to show that you can, if you look along these flame elements and extract the peak of the OH, that actually, the joint PDF of that versus the local consumption speed provides a pretty good correlation. So this thing is, is, is burning very intensely. Um, what are the implications of that for the NOx? What happens is here you get these little places where you have positive curvature, um, extremely high heat release, so you have temperatures that go above the adiabatic flame temperature. And if you look at what that means, you get enhanced production of these two um, nitrous oxide, nitrous, nitrogen species. So um, that's where some of this enhancement comes from, and um, so that's what those things look like in a cross-section at one spot. Okay. Um, you can pick this apart ad nauseum. So we went through and tried to classify. We went through and tried to classify um, these things. What's the nitrogen doing as a function of how intensely it's burning? And you can break things up into bins that way. I guess it's worth noting that um, this has this is the hydrogen. This is the nitrogen sub mechanism. So we had at least 58 reactions. Uh, I think there were 17 species in this one. So you can, you can pick this all apart. And um, at the end of the day, you can find out where the emissions are coming from. And um, this is, so this is, this is a reaction, an integrated reaction path diagram where the little numbers, those are regions where it's weakly burning, moderately burning, and, and strong burning. And that just gives you a complete breakdown of what the, the NOx cycle is doing through this thing. And um, if we integrate that over time, we end up with uh, about 0.85 parts per million. And what they observed at four atmospheres was, was um, actually one. So it's fairly close. We tried to push this up. Um, I should say the caveat first, then I'll say the caveat again. This was a nitrogen, uh, this was a nitrogen chemistry mechanism that was designed for atmospheric pressure, so whether it makes any sense here or not, I don't know. But what you see is that, um, at least according to this mechanism, the, whoa, I keep pushing the wrong button. The NO stays the same, more or less. Um, I see the, the place there's is N2O, I see some dramatic excitement of that at the, at the edge of the flame. But it then decays, so what's happening is um, the localized regions of high curvature, it's, it's, it's thinner, it can kink more, it leads to higher peaks. Um, but the net is that both the NO and the N2O are largely unchanged. Um, and the reason why the, what happens with the N2O is that at, at one atmosphere, it's basically just produced. At five, it's in produced much more intensely, but then it gets destroyed behind it, and again, no caveats about the mechanism. Um, now, so we've done this, and we've done a number of different laboratory scale experiments. And I would argue that although these are nice stunts, it's actually not really an ideal way to study turbulent premixed flames numerically. And the reason why are here's the, from my perspective, the worst one. You can't do anything with this until you've run it long enough to establish a statistical stationary steady state. And that takes forever. When, when Robert's in his laboratory, he lights his flame, then he walks across the room to where his data collection thing is. 
and turns it on, and computationally, that's an eternity. We, we, can, we can simulate these things for fractions of seconds at best, you know, probably milliseconds is more accurate. Um, and then if you start working with real experimentalists, there are actually issues with the characterization of the experiment. Um, the other thing you find is that DNS is not necessarily well suited to reproducing the long time statistical measurements. Robert will take a sequence of images over a certain number of minutes and say flame brush and he'll say, what's your flame brush? And I'll say, forget it, I can't do that. Um, then there's, you, you've got the stabilization mechanism. One of the things that we've shifted to is computationally modeling a freely propagating turbulent flame. So this is my idealization. I have a world full of turbulence. I light, light a flame somewhere and let it just propagate. And so here's a, here's a schematic. This is a, do a 3D simulation, sort of a width of L and make it be some number of multiples of L down. I put in a forcing term that will spin up turbulence. I can control the forcing term so I can control the turbulence that it spins up. Um, I put a flame up at the top and just let it propagate down and I can measure all the things I want to. Um, disadvantage of this is it doesn't last forever. Um, the advantage of this is you don't have a lot of burn-in time. You can get, start collecting data from it pretty quickly. Um, what we've done with that is methane simulations over a sequence of Karlovitz numbers. This is done with GRI 3.0 without the emissions chemistry, so that's 35 species and 217 reactions. This is at phi equal 0.7, so there's, uh, that's the flame speed, about 19 centimeters per second, 660 micron flame thickness, and at this scale, we're able to get turbulence that has a 2.64 millimeter integral scale. So these are done at an effective resolution of um, that. That's like 8 billion cells. Um, I should mention that when we did the emissions for the low, mo for the low swirl burner, that was actually an effective resolution of 64 billion cells when there were actually 4 billion active. So the, this is actually relatively computationally efficient. Um, so I'm going to just page through some pictures here. Um, okay, so this is Karlovitz 4, and um, in turbulent flame world, this is boring. Um, it's exactly what you'd expect. There's absolutely no variation along the flame front except for 3D cutting effects. That's the temperature, fuel consumption, heat release. If I go up to Karlovitz 12, I start to see a little bit of structure and variation. You can't see it very well, but there's a little bit of variability starting to happen along the flame front. And if I go up to 36, um, Carl at 36, now I start to see some interesting stuff. I'm seeing a bunch of temperature getting um, bled into the preheat zone. And if you look at this really closely, you can see some distinct variation in places of very high positive curvature. Um, and I, this is, this is, this kind of stuff is the signature of being on the way to distributed. But if I, I want to zoom in on that a little bit so you can see what's going on. Um, this is, so here's the temperature, but here's the fuel, con sorry, this is a little hard to read. This is the fuel consumption and the, and the um, heat release. You can see at some of these regions of very high positive curvature, the th flame's actually going out. And um, if you look, so the way GRI mech works is the first thing that happens chemically is you strip off a hydrogen and get CH3. That looks relatively uniform, a little bit of, a uh, little bit weaker there. Um, then some of the more stable intermediates, C2H6, formaldehyde, they seem to be enhanced in these regions, whereas uh, C2H singlet is, is diminished. Um, so do I know what's going on here? Actually, no, I don't, but what, what seems to be going on is that as we move along the path towards increasing turbulence density, we're selectively disrupting some of the reaction channels, and my methane flame, which is supposed to look like a nice unity Lewis number thing, is now showing substantial curvature effects. So that's interesting. Um, that raises the question, uh, can you make something distributed? And this is a completely different kind of example. Um, this is not a hydrocarbon flame, this is a carbon flame. Um, this is from astrophysics. I, I thought there might be a prize for the person who did the highest pressure flame at the workshop, 
and if there is, I win. Um, maybe. Okay. Um, this is um, this is from this is so this is this is actually an example. I've made the claim that this works at um, with a non-ideal equation of state and. The equation of state that you use in these astrophysics things, there's sort of an ideal gas looking piece, but then there's a radiation pressure term, and there is a degenerate Fermi electron gas term. So the pressure is really not ideal. Um, and what happens as, as the flame gets, uh, so this is all with the same turbulence, but you change the density, the, the smaller the density, the weaker the, the combustion. These are really bizarre flames. They are they are Lewis number of 10 to the seventh. Higher the Lewis number makes it easy to distribute. So this is, um, so what we've got is these are the laminar flame solutions in red, and then this is, oh, these, are, these are the carbon density versus the temperature, and here you see something, it's basically very weak turbulence, it's burning just like the laminar flame. Here you see a whole bunch of disruption of the flame, it's, it's kind of being chewed up, and that's shown in this, this high scatter of, of density temperature. And then you get to this point, the flame zone is really thick. You've got a complete collapse of everything back onto one surface, and it's really different than um, the laminar flame. We tried to do that for hydrogen, methane, and propane. You can kind of get it. You could you know, maybe these are transitional. I'm not sure. These are these are at nominal Karlovitz of 410 and Dom Kohler of 0.015, um, with the caveat that that at some point in doing all this, we decided that um, defining defining flame speeds and flame thicknesses for hydrogen using the laminar flame speed value was just meaningless. So we found a way of extracting a flame thickness and a uh, flame speed from the freely propagating that, that turbulent, bulby looking thing. Well, it's not turbulent, it's just propagating to free space. But from that, that freely propagating thermodiffusely unstable flame, we calculate a flame speed and a thickness, and we use that to define the Karlovitz number, which makes things collapse better. These are maybe just starting to distribute. But one of the things that we've identified it, as a signature of distributed is that if you look at a PDF of mod grad rho, it should, it's exponential, which is sort of a characteristic that the whole thing's just being dominated by, by um, turbulent mixing. And then here's a, a sequence of, of simulations at increasing Karlovitz number that show that you're really not exponential when you're, these are, here you're just barely getting toward this, what we call distributed at this last case, which is that guy. So you can see that you, uh, you, you approach this as you increase the turbulence intensity. So th that's sort of our, we find that to be a good model for transition. Um, so that's basically it. So, so I, I've talked about sort of this low Mach number methodology um, of a formulation that exploits the separation of scales and um, works with detailed chemistry and transport. We can do laboratory scale experiments like the low swirl burner. We can also do uh, idealized premix flames at, at higher turbulence. Um, what we're doing now, we're actually right now doing some of these idealized things with dodecane, which um, dodecane is interesting because it's a very heavy fuel, so lean dodecane starts to look a little bit like the astrophysical flames, kind of interesting. Uh, we may do high pressure jet flames if my collaborators ever get around to getting a specification of what that looks like. Um, and in the spirit of this meeting, if you have, if you can think of clever things to do with this, please contact me. And now I get to have a rant, so bear with me. Um, I've been here, I, I confess, I don't understand any of the laboratory stuff, but without a doubt, this is the most impressive collection of laboratory facilities for combustion I've ever seen. And it's also the case that you guys just got a top 10 supercomputer delivered here, which as near as I can tell seems to be more or less dedicated exclusively to doing combustion simulations. Um, or at least half of it, I'm told. Um, and and so, so I'll throw out maybe a couple of outrageous opinions. Um, and let me start by saying, um, 
we've, when I started doing these simulations, we couldn't do very much, but now we, many groups, there are many groups that have gotten to the point with these DNS style simulations that we can actually do a real live, honest to God laboratory flame experiment. Can we do all of them? No, of course not. In fact, one of my other outrageous claims is there's a ceiling out there there's a limit to what you can do with DNS. There's a ceiling. I'm not quite sure where it is, but there is absolutely a ceiling. There is, these will be the best we can do ever, period, unless someone finds a non-silicon-based way to do build computers. Um, but we can do simulations of laboratory-scale flames, and that is potentially a game-changer in this that, that you guys ought to think about taking advantage of. Because, you know, typically, okay, I go run my DNS and it's nowhere near close to what anybody else can do in a laboratory, so I do that and I write my paper and my laboratory colleague writes their paper and maybe we compare and say, yeah, yeah, we're seeing, but, but I ought to be able to do a DNS of an experiment and I ought to be able to match it quantitatively. And um, based on some experience, I can tell you what will happen is no, it won't match. And um, but that's where the opportunity lies. There's an opportunity to see if you can use high-end computing and the sophisticated laboratory scale experiments to really unravel what's going on in these things where, yes, part of it is, uh, like we talked about, well, maybe I need to do heat transfer to the walls in my, in my DNS model, okay? Maybe the experiment isn't characterized right, something's wrong with that. But you can ask other questions. You can ask, is the chemistry good? Um, I, I, I've gotten into arguments with colleagues, but I, I would claim that even for really simple fuels, our knowledge of combustion kinetics is not very good, and I suspect that transport is worse. That's at atmospheric pressure, and if you go to higher pressures, you know, I raise this issue, are there non-ideal effects that you need to consider? Do we have the data to do this? There's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff, and there's an enabling factor in this that you get by being able to do something without having to introduce a turbulence model or a turbulence flame interaction model that, that would be really good to push on. Anyway, thank you. <laughs>